Well, good evening, everyone, my respected friends and my dear young people and brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the topic tonight is in the form of a question. What good does it do for me? What about this word good? What is good? There are many definitions of good, but the definition I will use tonight is benefits or advantages. And I will restate the question a little to baptism. What benefits or advantages does it have for me? Here's a, a brief sidetrack. I have to confess some un easiness in presenting material on this particular subject. Cambridge Ecclesia has been blessed with four baptisms of young people in the recent past. These new members know the answers to this question. Their parents and teachers know the answers to this question. The four brethren who gave the four baptismal talks know the answer to this question. We had an online program about a month ago in which six brethren who have taken part in pre-baptismal conversations were interviewed. And these brethren know the answers to this question. There are about 95 members currently in the, in the Cambridge Ecclesia, and they know the answers to this question. I am, so to speak, to a large extent, preaching to the converted. Nevertheless, I will proceed with the hope that those already baptized will find a point or two or three to consider further, and with the hope of, that those in the process of learning the truth will be able to increase their knowledge and understanding of this important topic. What I want to do is to present statements from the Bible, first to set out a base which shows the problem faced by all of us, and then to outline the way of escape that God offers. And here is an outline of what I will follow. The entrance of sin and death into the world, God's plan and purpose for the earth, the promises of God, baptism, prerequisites for a valid baptism. What does baptism accomplish? Is baptism a necessity for salvation? And finally, summary and questions. It is a fact of life that all of us will die sooner or later. It may be at a young age or in older years. It may be as a result of an accident or an illness or in the inevitable natural course of events. Every one of us will die and cease to exist, and none of us can stop it from happening. A sobering thought, is it not? The Bible tells us that this condition was brought upon mankind as a result of the actions of one man. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, when God is handing out the penalty for disobedience, God speaks to Adam. And he said unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. The Apostle Paul echoes this thought in Romans chapter 5, where he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. This is the state into which mankind is born and begins a journey through life along what we will call man's road. Man is born, he grows, he matures, he ages and declines, and he dies. 
Along the way, man may or may not suffer injuries, disease, disabilities, and so on. But sooner or later, by accident, disease, or the natural course of events, man will die. Along the way, man does what he thinks is best for himself, satisfying the desires of the flesh. This road, man's road, leads ultimately to eternal death. It is written in, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Man's way and the other way, which is God's way, are both described in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, where the writer says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. It's in the Bible that God provides a hope of escape from death and destruction. And we want to outline the basis of that hope. First of all, God has a plan for the earth. He has a plan to fill this earth with his glory. It's written in Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now, if you're using the King James Version, you may notice that the word as there is in italics, and it's really not in the original. So God is really saying, but truly I live. God is emphasizing his plan and purpose to fill the earth with his glory, as truly as he lives. That plan involves the earth being inhabited by men and women who would manifest his glory forever. In, in Isaiah chapter, chapter 45, it is written, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. God revealed his plan for the earth and mankind by a series of promises and predictions from the very beginning. Let's consider those promises for a few minutes. In Eden, God promised the woman that her seed or descendant would put sin to death while suffering a non-fatal wound in the process. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, this seed would be her descendant the seed of the woman, not a descendant of the man. In other words, God would be his father. Genesis 3.15 records God's words. Reading from the ESV, God says, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Here is a specific singular descendant. The Apostle Paul confirms that this singular offspring was God's son, Jesus, in Galatians chapter 4. We read, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Back in Genesis, God made several promises to Abraham, at least one of which was also made to a future seed or descendant a promise of an eternal inheritance in the land of Canaan. One such promise is recorded in Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 to 17. Abraham was standing between Bethel and Ai, northwest of the Dead Sea, overlooking the Jordan River and the, lot, the land beyond the Jordan. Lot had chosen that particular land. In Genesis 13, we read, starting at verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, 
to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Paul in Galatians chapter 3 in verse 16, which we read a few minutes ago, says, this seed is Christ. Now to Abram and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. God also promised David that he would have a seed whose father would be God, a seed who would reign on David's throne forever, and that David himself would see it. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting at verse 12, we read these words. And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, in other words, this promise would occur after David had died. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Skipping down to verse 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. David's descendant would receive a kingdom, build a house for God's name, and his throne would last forever. And God would be the father of this descendant. And this kingdom would be established before David himself. In other words, David would be alive to see it forever. An angel told Mary, the mother of Jesus, prior to his birth, that he was the promised seed of David. In Luke chapter 1, we read these words of the angel. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Mary's son would be the son of God. He would receive the throne of his ancestor, David. And that throne would be established forever. Now, here is a very important point. We want to emphasize that the promises to Abraham and to David have implicit in them three key items. Forgiveness of sins, resurrection, and a change of nature to the divine immortal nature. The apostle Peter described the promises and the wonderful things associated with them. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, Peter writes, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might by, be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God is working out his plan through his son Jesus, the promised seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, and the seed of David, offering participation to others on the basis of his love and their faith. Let's read some familiar words in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We want to examine this phrase, whosoever believeth in him. The Greek preposition here translated in is ice. And ice is a very versatile word with a number of translations. The one used most often by a large margin 
twice as often as the next uh, frequent occurrence means into and it's almost three times more than the third most frequent translation onto. If we use the most common rendering of ice, in other words, into, the phrase would read, whosoever believeth into him. Now this sounds strange to our ear when we say that, whosoever believeth into him. But logically it makes sense as we, as we shall see action is re, is implied and indeed is required there must be a movement into christ with that background we want to review what the bible says about how a person can move into christ and associate himself or herself with jesus christ and with the exceeding great and precious promises of god we are not in, in christ by birth constitutionally, that is, on principles by which a person is governed. We are in Adam by birth, both physically and constitutionally. We get into Christ by belief of and obedience to the truth. Baptism is a dividing line between those who are in Christ and those who are not. As we will see, baptism inducts the believer into Jesus Christ and so we want now to approach the subject of baptism itself. The English word baptism is derived from the Greek, and the key Greek word is baptizo. According to Mickelson's Enhanced Strong's Dictionary, so the Greek and Hebrew Testament, baptizo means to immerse or submerged or make overwhelmed or soaked I fully wet to engulf entirely with, as if with water. The act of biblical baptism involves full immersion in water. One New Testament reference showing that baptism was total immersion in water is the case of the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. The eunuch was an in a chariot returning to Ethiopia from Jerusalem. And he was reading a passage from Isaiah 53, which was a prophecy about Christ. God commanded Philip to go to the chariot and talk to the eunuch. We read this in Acts chapter 8. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch had some knowledge, but he lacked understanding. Philip's preaching gave him that understanding, and it produced belief. The eunuch confessed that he believed, and he requested that Philip baptize him. Note that the text tells us that they went down both into the water where the baptism occurred, and then they came up out of the water. Another example which shows the concept of full immersion is found in Romans chapter 6, where Paul writes, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Here is a picture of a symbolic death. One dies symbolically to the old way of life. A symbolic burial, buried, clearly indicates the sense of a complete coverage and a symbolic resurrection as a new person to a new way of life. That person has committed to walk along a new road, God's road, God's way, a way leading toward eternal life by the grace of God. He may still die, but the road he is on 
entails the hope of resurrection and immortality. In Acts chapter 8, another incident involving Philip at Samaria is recorded. When they, the, the Samaritans, believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Just as with the Ethiopian eunuch, we see that belief was required for baptism. A person may have knowledge and understanding, but not belief. Belief is essential. We also must note that repentance, a, a desire for change and obedience is also critical. If there is no belief, then there is no repentance, no desire for change, and no commitment to a new way of life. At the time of Pentecost, soon after Jesus had ascended, uh, ascended to heaven, Peter spoke to Jews assembled in Jerusalem. And we read in Acts chapter 2, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. They were instructed to repent, that is, change direction, and then be baptized. Today in the Christadelphian community, baptism is preceded by a public confession of faith in answer to the question, Do you believe in the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ? And we see there from Acts chapter 8, this is what, is what the Samaritans believe. They believe the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. It's assumed that one who confesses belief also confesses a desire for repentance and a commitment to a new godly life. A number of things happen when a person is baptized into Christ. Let's go back to Galatians 3 which we read earlier, and take a look at verses 26 to 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Children of God, sons and daughters of God, we become God's own children and enjoy all the privileges and share the responsibilities of a new family life in which God is the Father. We have many brothers and sisters in this new family who are also brothers and sisters of Christ. We put on Christ. The, the word put on there means to invest with clothing, put on a garment. So figuratively at baptism, we are covered with Christ, as it were. And we become one with other believers, no matter what their race, no matter what their economic status or gender, all are members of the body of Christ. Members in one body, different roles, members one of another, a concern for one another. If we are Christ's, then we are counted as Abraham's seed and heirs. We are brought into the covenant that God made with Abraham with the opportunity to receive the promised inheritance. Notice in verse 29, the very little but very big meaning word, if. We'll come back to this word later. Right now I want to focus on another word in verse 29, and that word is heirs. An heir is one who stands to receive an allotted possession by right of sonship. And this is brought out clearly in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. What a privilege that would be. What a hope that offers. What is that hope? Heirs according to the promise, as we saw in Galatians 29. But there is more. Hebrews 1, 14. 
Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And here it's the angels who are uh, spoken of as being ministers, uh, ministering spirits sent forth to minister to people who shall be the heirs of salvation. James 2 verse 5, hearken my beloved brethren, James says, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them who love him. And Titus chapter 3, verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirship speaks of the future. But what about now? Recall the words of Jesus as he met his, with his apostles at the Last Supper, just before his arrest. After breaking bread and distributing it to them, to them, he gave them a cup of wine. And he said this, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins for the remission of sins. This should take our minds back to the three important factors we identified in the promises made in Eden and in the promises made to the, of the fathers of Israel. Forgiveness of sin, resurrection, and change of nature to the divine immortal nature. I want to note that this word testament the, here, the Greek word for that, is rendered covenant in eight different other versions that I consulted. I want to add here, just by way of passing, two interesting alternative translations to Matthew 26, 28. It's interesting to note here that the translators seem to have recognized the importance of the promises and the covenant that God made with Abraham. The Holman Christian Study Bible says this, For this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And the Weymouth rendering is, For this is my blood which is to be poured out for many for the remission of sins, the blood which ratifies the covenant. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we find Paul's comments on sins and forgiveness. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of, God, of our God. The Corinthians were guilty of all kinds of sins, but they believed the truth, they repented, and they were baptized. God is willing to forgive one who is sincerely repentant. And notice the effect in verse 11. You're washed. Through baptism, one's sins are forgiven. You're sanctified. Through baptism, one is set apart for God, made holy in the sight of God. And you're justified. Through baptism, one is counted as being righteous in the sight of God. There is another action that occurs at baptism, and this is also connected with the forgiveness of sins. It's in Colossians chapter 1. And having made peace through the blood of his cross to him, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. The Apostle Paul in this passage speaks of a change of relationship to God. To reconcile means to bring together those who are at variance, return them to favor, to bring back a former state of harmony. That meaning is brought out in the phrase, right at the beginning, may peace. And Paul goes on to speak in more detail of this change of relationship in verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, 
Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, all by grace. Paul goes on in his letter to the Ephesians to provide some additional details. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Skipping down to verse 19, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Verses 11 and 12 there describe the state of the Ephesian believers before they were baptized. Without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In verse 13, we see that the relationship has changed. Now, in Christ Jesus, in this new relationship, in Christ, one is made nigh. And verse 19 provides additional information about that change. Now in verse 19, notice that it clearly states that ye are no more strangers and foreigners. But I want you to take a look at the following two passages. One is in Hebrews 11, verse 13, where it says, of the worthies of old, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. First Peter 2, verse 11, Peter writes, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. We see here a contradiction between these two passages and the one in Ephesians. What's the answer to that? How do you explain that? The answer is change of relationship. They say that one picture is worth a thousand words. So let's look at a picture. Here is a picture uh, with two columns, relationship to the state and relationship to God. And we'll speak first of the natural man. Natural man is born to be a citizen of the state in which he lives. His relationship to God is that same relationship we saw in Ephesians chapter 2. He's an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. He's a stranger from the covenants of promise. He's without hope. He's without God. And he's afar off. At some point in time, this natural man came into contact with the truth of God, God's word. It may have been through a friend, a neighbor, colleague at work or school or a family member. It may have been through a pamphlet left at the door or discovered on a park bench. It may have been through the internet or a multitude of other ways. The natural man became interested. He read and studied the scriptures, possibly with a mentor, and develop the knowledge and understanding and the belief in God's plan and the salvation it offers to man. He developed a desire to be part of God's plan and that he must be baptized into Christ. He did so after confessing his belief and became what we will call a spiritual man. His baptism and now he's a spiritual man. His position as a natural citizen of the state changed to that of being a stranger, a sojourner, a pilgrim with respect to the world, as we saw in Hebrews 11 and 1 Peter chapter 2 in the last slide. 
this relationship with God transferred from being an alien and a stranger to being a fellow, fellow citizen with the saints in the household of God and being made nigh to God. Notice also that his position as a natural citizen of the state had changed to being a fellow citizen with the saints in the household of God. And the natural man's position as being a stranger from the covenants of promise has changed to being a stranger, a sojourner, or a pilgrim in the world. Uh, I think this is a, a vivid uh, illustration of the change of relationship that occurs when one is baptized. Baptism is the first act of obedience. The whole life after bapt baptism must be such to maintain the position then attained. Being in Christ, forgiven, justified, sanctified, reconciled to God, being an heir, and so on. It's necessary to continue in this state if Jesus is to grant salvation by grace at his judgment seat when he comes again. At baptism, a person is said to enter a race for eternal life. Paul gives some instruction in 1 Corinthians 9, reading from the ESV. It reads there, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Paul is not treating this as a normal race in which only one person is the winner. In this race, all faithful finishers win the prize, so to speak. He is not saying, just go out there and run. He is saying, run like a winner with run, with focus, with will and stamina of an elite athlete. Weymouth uh, expresses this well. He said, do you not know that in the foot race, the runners all run, but that only one gets the prize? You must run like him in order to win with certainty. May I suggest like that the, the phrase like him has the implication of like Christ, because we are told to follow him. Paul goes on to provide some personal details about his own running. There are basically two ways of life, the way of the flesh and the way of the spirit, God's way. And care is required to stay on the right road. Paul certainly wanted to stay on God's road. This is what he said about the things of the world compared to the things of God. We read about that in 1 Corinthians, in, in Philippians uh, chapter 3. Oh, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I find myself, I myself should be disqualified. In Philippians chapter 3 now, we read about his opinion about the things in the world, things that he had. But whatever, things I, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his, his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul was driven by his desire to be found in Christ. He counted the things of this world as valueless compared to the riches, some of which we have not mentioned tonight, 
to be stowed to those in Christ at the judgment seat. A couple of questions arise. Question one, is baptism really necessary? Answer one, yes. Question two, aren't faith and good works sufficient? Answer two, no. Consider the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he spoke to his apostles just before he ascended into heaven. We read it in Matthew 28. And I'm reading from the Weymouth edition. Jesus, however, came near and said to them, All power in heaven and over the earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey every command which I have given you. And remember, I am with you always, day by day, until the close of the age. Jesus said, make disciples and baptize them. Another example which shows the necessity of baptism is the story of Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile, a Roman soldier, a centurion, who lived in Caesarea. We pick up his story in Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea named, called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose name, surname was Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. In verse 2, we see that Cornelius was a good man, devout, God-fearing, generous to the Jews. He prayed to God, but all this was insufficient for his salvation. The apostle Peter was, was given a vision, and he went to see Cornelius in Caesarea. Peter spoke to Cornelius and his associates, and as he was speaking, the Holy Spirit was poured out in the Gentiles. We recognize that the Holy Spirit was given in the first century, but not today. To Peter, this was an indication of God blessing the Gentiles. And Peter commanded that Cornelius and his associates should be baptized. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard him speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. One final and brief example which shows the necessity of baptism. We have seen earlier how coming into Christ through baptism associates one with the exceeding great and precious promises and the eternal inheritance which God has promised to the faithful. Baptism and everything connected with it is the only way to attain that association. So let's look at some of the things that occur when one is validly baptized. This list is by no means complete, but it does summarize items which have appeared in our remarks this evening. We can summarize all these things here, I think, in three little words. Peace. Peace with God, peace with yourself, trust and assurance in God. 
purpose. History is going somewhere. God is in control. A desire to be part of God's purpose with the earth, a desire to serve the almighty creator of heaven and earth. Hope. Hope in a hopeless world. Hope for a restored earth. Hope for the kingdom. Hope for a righteous rule of peace. Hope for immortality. I began this evening with a question, and I'll wrap up with a series of questions that each must answer for himself or herself. Do you consider these things to be benefits and advantages? How do they work away against the things of the world? The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 that he counted them but refuge or garbage in comparison to knowing Christ, being found in him and attaining onto the resurrection of the dead. Are these benefits and advantages? Now, for those who have not yet been baptized, if you believe that baptism does produce benefits and advantages for you, do you believe the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, much of which we have mentioned today? If the answer is yes, then you must ask and answer the question posed by the e Ethiopian eunuch to Philip. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What is to prevent my being baptized? What's your answer? 